My name is Jen Heal. Um, I'm a design advisor at the Design Commission for Wales and delighted to be invited to um, chair today's session. Um, so uh, good afternoon and welcome um, to the Creating Healthy Places and Spaces um, session. Um, the topic of um, placemaking is obviously a very important topic for um, planning, design, um, and also um, uh, the health of the people who occupy those places. Um, it's one I think we can all relate to from our own personal experience and um, the way places are planned and designed has an impact on the way we live our lives um, and uh, the things that we do and therefore an impact on our health and well-being, either positively or negatively. And maybe our personal experiences of those things have been um, heightened or um, perhaps exposed a little bit more in the past two years over this um, pandemic period. Um, but professionally, perhaps um, the link between the connection between planning and health has not always been um, so clear. So um, I really welcome the work that Gemma and Cheryl have been doing to help enable greater collaboration between um, and joint working between planners and health professionals. And um, that's the topic that we're going to be exploring today, um, the topic of this webinar. Um, it's uh, about highlighting information and resources um, and support that are available to help increase collaboration between spatial planners and health professionals. Um, it's about um, demonstrating why that joint working is so important. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping from me then before I hand over um, uh, to, to Gemma and Cheryl. Um, after their presentation, there will be time for Q&A, question and answers. Um, if you have any questions as the presentations are taking place, please do put them in the chat box. Um, I'll pick those up and, and put them to, to Gemma and Cheryl after their presentations. Um, so if there are any issues, please, um, or any questions, please um, put them in there. Similarly, if there are any issues you have, if you have any technical issues, pop that in the chat as well and somebody go to help you with that. Um, please note that this session is being recorded and it will be available um, after the session as well um, um, on the Public Health Network Cymru's website. There are subtitles available. Um, uh, in English and Welsh, these can be switched on using the button at the bottom right of your screens if you'd like to. Um, however, just an uh, awareness and I guess apology in advance that sometimes the Welsh auto-generated subtitles are not always very accurate. Um, the aim is to close the, the webinar by three o'clock um, and um, as I say, the information from this um, session will be available afterwards if you want to go back to it. Um, so at this point, um, I'd like to welcome Gemma and Cheryl, Gemma Christian, Cheryl Williams um, from Public Health Wales, who have been uh, job sharing a role as principal HIA development officers for spatial planning in the WIAZU team. Um, so over to them for their presentation and do please put any questions you have um, in the chat facility. Thanks Gemma and Cheryl. Thank you Jen. Good afternoon everybody. So uh, welcome, it's lovely to see that so many people have, have come along today to uh, to join us from a quite a wide variety of sectors um, both inside and outside of Wales so it's lovely that you're all here with us today. So um, what this webinar is about as Jen said is about creating healthy places and spaces and how we can really work in a joined up way as planners, as health professionals and others who are working in this field. Um, we had an event on the 10th of February um, which explored this topic in some detail and this webinar is following on from that event a couple of weeks ago. So as you heard from Jen, um, Jem and I are on a short secondment in the WIASU team, that's the Wales Health Impact Assessment Support Unit um, which sits within Public Health Wales. And our specific role is to support the joined up working between planning and health. So just give a bit of background about us. So I, my background is as a public health specialist. So my substantive role is in Cardiff and Vale local public health team. 
Um, and my role within that team is, involves responsibility for working with planners. So I work with planners in the Cardiff and Vale area. Um, but my first career was in planning, um, first in Coventry and then in Cardiff before I had a change of career. So kind of crossing the two now, which is quite interesting. Um, and Gemma's substantive role is in the planning directorate in Welsh Government. So she's a chartered planner and she's previously worked in the local in a local planning authority in England as a policy planner. So between the two of us, we've been having this job share in terms of linking planning and health together. So what we're going to do in this session is um, we're going to look at placemaking first of all. So what is placemaking and how does it help to create um, healthy places? And then we're going to look at, at um, a brief overview of spatial planning and health. What does it actually mean and why joining them up is so important? I will provide some examples of planning for health by talking through the use of evidence and data and collaboration techniques and engagement and highlighting some ways this has been done in different areas. So give you some examples of how that can work. And then finally, we're going to talk through some tools and guides that Gemma and, my, and myself have been working on while in the WIASU team that we hope will support this joined up working. And these tools will be available shortly on the WIASU website. So firstly, looking at <coughs> placemaking, <coughs> so as Jen said, this is a really, it's really holistic approach, I guess, to the planning and design of development and spaces, and it really focuses on positive outcomes in creating healthy, active, well-connected communities. And in that way, that approach very much aligns with planning for health generally and about, well, about creating good well-being for people living in these communities. So it really draws on an area's potential to create high quality development and public spaces that really promote people's, not just their health, but their happiness, their prosperity and their well-being in the widest sense. So on this slide, you can see the six principles of placemaking. So starting at the top, the people and community. So it's really about considering what are the needs of the community at the outset. So both in terms of people who are currently living in an area, but also people who might come in, be coming into an area, into a new housing development, for example. What will their needs be? How will their needs be met? And also, it really importantly, involving people in the decisions um, that are going to affect them in that area. Um, the second principle is about location. So it's about using land efficiently and creating well-connected communities. So communities that people can get between, they can access services they need to get to, they can access activities, they're connected to their neighbours. They know each other, they're, it's well connected and it feels like a neighbourhood. And th th the third one is movement and movement in, in this context, we're talking about prioritising walking, cycling and public transport as methods of active travel, of healthy travel opportunities. So having them there available, but also making sure they're integrated and connected so that they're not just in the middle of, of nowhere, not connected to anything else. You've got to have really good routes that lead on to other places and they connect people to the things they want to go to and they're safe and accessible and easy to use as well. And then a mix of uses. So placemaking is about places that have a range of purposes. So it isn't just one use. It's a mix of uses on in an area creating a neighbourhood. And that means that places can become quite diverse and vibrant uh, as communities. And then in public realms, so streets, public spaces are well defined. They're safe and they're accessible. So places like green space, open spaces, they're easy to get to. They, they're welcoming, they're well lit, they're used well and they're accessible for the whole of the population that want to use them. <clears throat> and then finally, identity. And that's really about reflecting that different spaces and areas have distinctive qualities. So if we're talking about um, areas in Wales, we're really talking about respecting the Welsh language in many areas and the culture and what might be happening in that particular area that's really unique to that area. So it's really about reflecting what it means to live in that area. So the six principles is quite a nice overview of healthy planning, really, if you look at it from a placemaking perspective. So looking at planning for healthy places more specifically, a lot of you are probably familiar with this <coughs> diagram on this slide here. And this is looking at what we call the wider determinants of health. So planning has a really strong influence on many of these wider determinants of health. 
So if you're familiar with this diagram, you'll know in the center it's the individual and things that make that individual who they are. So their age, their gender, their ethnicity, for example. But all the other things around that person are what affects them in terms of their well-being. So it's about where they live, it's about their lifestyle, the community around them. All of these impact on individuals. So planning clearly impacts upon the built and natural environment, but it also impacts upon lifestyles. So, for example, if people can cycle or walk easily in the local area, that could change their lifestyle. It also impacts on things like community. So, for example, if there's spaces where people can meet and socialise, planning can help create that sense of community and neighbourhood. So the next point on this slide is um, thinking that uh, it's fairly obvious, really, but health is broader than just the provision of health services. So when we're talking about health, health care provision is clearly crucial because we need to have GP practices, pharmacies, dentists, hospitals, etc. But healthcare services is only one element of health. And the impact of the natural and built environment on the physical and mental health of individuals should be considered both in planning policy and in development management, in master planning, infrastructure planning, etc. So it isn't just about where we locate healthcare services, it's about how all these things, all these wider determinants impact on the health, on the health and well-being of individuals. So by planning for health, we can enable people to make choices that will benefit their well-being, um, that are easy, that are accessible and they're safe. For example, as I mentioned um, a while ago, walking and cycling routes, locating facilities and services in neighbourhoods, in communities, designing buildings that can be adapted as people age, providing accessible green spaces and play areas, all examples of how we can enable people to make positive lifestyle choices that will really benefit their well-being. But we can also help to reduce inequalities through planning for health, and that means um, inequalities in terms of access to services or activities or facilities, but also inequalities in the ability of individuals to adopt positive lifestyle behaviours could be addressed through planning for health because we have a lot of inequalities in, um, in our communities and lots of differences in um, mortality, mobility. So we can address all of those by the way we plan our environment and enable people to take positive lifestyle behaviour choices. Um, finally, we can maximise outcomes by thinking about place in a strategic way. So building on the understanding of health profiles for, of an area, we can highlight cross sector opportunities to address issues. We can add value and we can create sustainable, healthy places. So if you work alongside public health professionals as a planner, it can help to gain understanding of the health needs of a population. So, for example, you might want to be looking specifically at issues for what, for an area such as obesity rates or levels of dementia if you've got high numbers of older people in an area. And these can be really important factors in designing the environment for the future and focusing on specific population need because that population need varies vastly. And we've got lots of people here from across Wales and there, there's what the needs are in, an, in a community in Cardiff, for example, be very different to the needs of a rural community in North Wales, just as examples there. You need to really look at what the needs are of your own population and what's going to really help to create a healthy environment for the future and looking at future trends as well in terms of population. So we know that we've got an ageing population, for example, across Wales. So ageing aging population means different needs for the community in the future. So we need to kind of take into account uh, what's happening with our population. So by planning for health, we can actually maximise public health outcomes and we can do things such as re reduce obesity levels. We can increase physical activity levels and we can reduce inequalities. Just examples. There's, there's far more than that, but those are some examples in terms of public health outcomes that we can actually achieve. So I'm just going to hand over to Gemma for the next couple of slides. Thank you. So Cheryl's covered planning for healthy places in some detail and I'm going to talk a little bit more around this on this slide and then look a bit more at the data, evidence, resources um, in the next following few slides. So as I said, it's important to have that clarity and understanding of what planning can do for um, health and well-being and what that means in practice and on the ground. And we talk about a health in all policies approach, but it's what does that actually mean and how do we do that? So as part of today, we're going to run through some practical resources we've developed um, through the secondment and some tools and approaches that can help deliver that. Um, part of that, one of the 
um, kind of obvious ones is um, health impact assessment as a really key tool and adopting this place making approach that Cheryl's covered will help embed health and, health and well-being and look at how we can address these wider determinants of health through the plans and policies we're writing but that not just for planning but across the different sectors and at different scales so it's about having that evidence um, and data at all these different scales, so from the national, regional and local scale across health, well-being, inequalities and mental health. So as Cheryl said, it's about having that, um, that data and that knowledge to help shape those plans and policies to make sure you are meeting those local needs and addressing those inequalities. And HIA is a really um, effective tool in, in helping to shape this as part of, like a fundamental part of the process. So part of that's knowing where to find that information and we've um, well come on to that in a bit more detail. And then also how to interpret it. So that's a really key um, opportunity working with public health colleagues as planners to bring their knowledge and expertise into that discussion when um, developing all your policies of your, um, your local development plans or your strategic development plans, not just having you know consideration of a health policy, which could be something you do, but it's that throughout that health and all policies approach. And by doing this, you're maximising the outcomes and you're delivering multiple priorities, so not just priorities from a planning perspective, but from a health perspective and other, other organisational perspectives too. So embedding this approach and including training professional development, we can support the development of public health spatial planning professional workforce, which will help deliver these healthy spaces and places for everyone. So can we go on to the next slide, please? So I've talked a bit about kind of resources and information and um, we as you, um, I'm going to talk you through a few of that that we as you have um, produced at this kind of national scale. So there's loads of information on the, on the website um, and for example, we've just put a couple of examples here. So some health impact assessments been undertaken, some of these during the pandemic, looking at things like the social distancing policy, working from home. There's also some toolkits and guidance and reports. And the, the one report um, there, I'm going to talk to you in a bit more detail. So this was the recently published report um, on maximising health and wellbeing opportunities for spatial planning in the COVID-19 pandemic recovery. And I'll pop a link to it in the chat bar. Um, at the end of this. So this builds on previous work and adds to the evidence base and sets out trends and issues um, such as the different population groups and geographical areas affected um, through the pandemic. So such as those in deprivation of poor health, low income groups. Um, it also acknowledges that although it, the whole of Wales obviously have been affected by the pandemic, it, it extracts particular areas such as North East Wales, the South Wales Valleys, Newport and Cardiff has been disproportionately um, affected. So this is kind of data and evidence that's really important to shape um, future plans. Another aspect of the report highlights this, um, the opportunity for future collaboration between public health professionals and planners, but also other built environment professionals and stresses the importance of this going forward. So it covers a number of areas um, and the import looks at the importance of green infrastructure, um, access to digital infrastructure, the quality and provision of houses, but not just that, but it also talks in that place making sense around the surrounding environment to housing. So um, yes, yeah, so that's really important. Um, it recognises the important role of the health sector in shaping planning and the need to work together at the earliest stages of um, plan development. So other future opportunities um, it highlights is signing up to the placemaking charter, utilising and exploring different and innovative approaches to engagement and involvement. And this is where there could be some really exciting opportunities for um, collaboration but, um, and uh, between health and health professionals and planners and also discusses developing well-being thresholds and criteria for future developments. So I'll pop that link.
managed to meet myself then. I don't know how. <laughs> so um, there's a number of other tools and resources that Riazu um, have created and um, a couple of those I'll cover now. So one is the a toolkit. So looking at health impact assessments and local development plans, and that's a toolkit for practice. And it sets out the context and policy levers for people in you know developing this work and gives practical advice and resources for those developing a local development plan. So there's loads of information on the website. Um, um we'll pop a um, link in um, to the website there as well. So the next slide, please, Cheryl. So we've talked about the importance of uh, policy creation and this evidence and data, and we'll just talk through in a bit more detail about some of the sources of information there. But as you can imagine, there's there's lots of information available. So in Wales, I think it's really important to reflect that there's a really strong policy framework around this in Wales, including the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and the goals and um, ways of working. From a, policy, a planning perspective, we've got Planning Policy Wales and Future Wales, which is the National Plan for Wales. Um, and this sets out the, these set out the national planning policy context through a placemaking approach. Um, I've mentioned the Wiazi website, and we're actually currently updating that to include a section on spatial planning and health. So that'll be available um, in, the, in the coming weeks. And what we want to do is kind of pull together and collate some of the key areas of and sources of data and we'll also be publishing the tools we'll be talking about shortly on there. So having sourced that data is important to work collaboratively and to interpret and understand how that can shape your work and address these um, inequalities and health issues in your local area. So the website contains guidance and toolkits, not just from Public Health Wales, but links to other organisations such as Natural Resources Wales and area statements that they co-produce. So highlight, and this is to highlight the importance of cross-sectoral working um, wider than just um, planning and health. So next slide, please. So just going to talk um, a little bit around collaboration and engagement. So obviously this is a key principle um, that we need to you know, really use to shape the places we live in from both um, a planning and a health perspective to deliver these healthy, sustainable communities. So this is where you know, there's a real opportunity to do this jointly um, and help shape each other's work. So on the slide, we've set up a couple of examples of um, some tools and resources that are currently available around this. So the first is um, some education packs. So there's um, a set of um, resource packs for teachers for all key stages, looking at the planning system in Wales. So it addresses from the national to the local um, scales. It looks at these from a community perspective and an environmental perspective. It's got a, a planning game on there and it's got a toolkit for participation. Um, and it just kind of really sets out what planning is and how people can engage with this and shape the communities they live in, you know, and get the children and young people thinking about how they can get involved and, and shape their communities um, as they develop. The other area is um, we've popped in a little link there to Planning Aid Wales and they have a, a variety of um, engagement tools and and information on their on their website trying to help people engage with the planning system and they provide a load of case studies um, and they have a newsletter to share these kind of examples and also there's a they've done a lot of work around place planning and there's some guidance around that so that that's the very local local scale planning so i won't go into too much detail there but um there's lots of information around that on the planning aid wales website so i'll just hand over to back to Gemma. thanks Gemma. so we've talked a lot about um the importance of planning and health and how to join them up and why it's very logical and very um that's such a good idea to do it. Um, so I'm just going to give you some examples of how that actually in practical terms has been done in a couple of areas. So 
This first one here is um, actually borrowed from uh, one of our colleagues who works in the Betsy Cadwalder public health team. Um, but she recently worked in Cheshire West and she worked very closely with planners in that area. So I wanted to share this with you because those of you who are planners, um, maybe from the development management uh, area, this is specifically about development management. So planning applications and, and dealing with, with that process. So just to give an example of what, what can be done. So um, this is really how you use evidence data and collaborate and work closely into, in partnership. So in Cheshire West, um, the process that they would use was in was three parts, really. So before an application is received, before a planning application comes in at the pre-application stage, there was an assessment of what health input might be required at that stage. So was it public health input or was it healthcare service provision? Was it, for example, a GP practice that might be needed in that area? What was the health input that we needed? And that was discussed pre-application uh, at that stage. And then also um, at that stage was looking at whether a section 106 would be requested, and that is developer contributions potentially towards healthcare services or um, a public health um, improvement um, in that local area. So that was all discussed at pre-application stage in Cheshire West. And then when the full application was then submitted, when the planning application come in, public health would take the lead on responding to the application in terms of health and liaise with other health colleagues, so strategic planning, primary care. Um, so they have a broad perspective um, responding to the planning application. So it was it was um, coordinated by one person, but involved lots of people from health. Um, and then there was an assessment of whether a health impact assessment would be required. So they had a, a checklist, a criteria to go through for each application to say if it required a health impact assessment. So that was the policy in that area that they would have um, an assessment of whether a HIA was required. And then if the section 106 was to be requested, that would be done at that stage in the re response to the planning application. So then what they also would do is have um, ongoing support and advice for planning. So they'd have a duty desk would answer queries related to health impact, and they would also have close relationships to allow for that two way conversation. So Gemma and I have heard this constantly through this secondment that the partnership working and the key contacts that you make between planning and health and others who you work with from planning are so important because having that relationship just enables that communication to happen regularly and knowing who to talk to and who to ask for information on whether it's a population needs assessment or information about inequalities or whatever it might be information about healthcare services provision, you need to know who to go to quickly and communication is really important. So we've definitely learned that um, as well. And it shows is quite clearly in, in this example, really important. So um, the next example is um, Cardiff and Wales. So a, a, a Wales example. So this is really the work I do in my substantive role um, in the public health team. So. What, this is an example of um, joint up working with policy planning as opposed to development management. So this is about key collaboration on local development plans primarily. So we work closely with both local authorities in Cardiff and Vale from a health perspective in terms of the development of both of the local development plans, providing input, data and evidence, etc. into the LDP development. And um, we've also worked jointly on health focused supplementary planning guidance in both of those areas in, in Cardiff and Vale, which um, supplements their local development plans. So we what we do in this area, in our area in Cardiff and Vale, is I regularly meet with planners in the policy planning team and just to really share information about what's going on or new new evidence, new population needs assessment, whatever it might be. We just have regular catch up so that we know what's going on. At the moment, we're focused very much on LDP development. So we talk about where that is and what the next stage might involve in terms of public health input. And then the planners also, they meet jointly, Cardiff and Vale meet jointly together with health board. So some of my colleagues in the health board from strategic planning and primary care meet regularly with the planners. And this is really because Cardiff's got very large strategic sites with lots of development going on at the moment. And it's really important that the health board stays up to date with what's happening, what's coming, how many houses are being built, what, where it's at really in terms of, of all of the healthcare service provision requirements and needs for the future. And then some additional work that um, myself and others have been involved with in Cardiff and Vale is sometimes 
uh, pre-application stage, meeting with developers to talk about health and well-being and what that might look like on a particular site. Um, I've discussed design standards with a large housing developer and I've been involved in a couple of young people and planning projects. So using some of the tools that Gemma just described um, from Welsh Government about how planning, how young people can understand about planning. So we used those tools and built them up into a, a larger project looking at sites in Cardiff and how young people might like to plan them. So we've done um, some really interesting work in that area too. So coming to the next slide. So we wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, in, in, during our time in, in Wiasu, um, Gemma and I have developed a set of four tools, and these tools are really aimed to support planners and health professionals <clears throat> to work together to maximise opportunities and to deliver outcomes across the different sectors. And we were very aware, as Gemma said, there's lots of guidance available. There's an awful lot out there. There's lots of evidence. There's lots of places to go for it. But it, we wanted to really focus on the practicalities of how you do it and make it kind of, I guess, with this particular guy slide here, a simple way of knowing who does what <laughs> was the first thing we did. So this guide is, is spatial planning and health in Wales. Who does what in terms of health and planning? And I know you won't be able to read all of that because it's small, but you will be able to access it on the website. But it basically sets out at national, regional, and local level, who does what in planning and health. There's links, hyperlinks all over this document, so you can link through to websites and find out uh, maybe more information. What's the policy and strategy uh, framework for all of those organisations and what they do? And then the second part of this is about um, well-being, what well, the wider determinants of health, well-being, placemaking, and health. So give a bit of context around um, planning for health and what that might look like. And then links to toolkits, guidance, data, and evidence, and resources. So hopefully some uh, first point of call really for um, planning and health information, particularly focused on on Wales. So they can be it's an A3 document if you wanted to print it, but it's you will it will be accessible on the website and you can use all the links and see it in more detail if you want to later on. So the next tool that um, that we looked at developing was really to support health boards um, when they're commenting on planning applications. So. Um, health boards are not statutory consultees on for planning, so they wouldn't necessarily get sent a planning application um, all the time for, for for a comment. But what can happen is it can be agreed locally when a health board can be asked for comments. So it might be a, the scale of a housing, um, a residential development, or it might be on um, change of use, for example, or it might be uh, agricultural change. It might be anything that you can agree locally that a health board can actually be um, asked for comments on a planning application or it can be that somebody in the public health team or the health board can scan the list of planning applications and want to comment so that's happened in certainly in my area in Cardiff and Vale we've looked at it from a, a public health perspective and impact on healthcare service provision so we really wanted to create a tool that would help to guide health boards in responding to applications so what it does again it'll be on the website shortly You'll have had it if um, you came to the, the event in, on the 10th of Feb, or your colleagues might have had it. But um, what it does is it uses an evidence base for comments. So those wider determinants, the impact on health um, of all of the, of the natural and built environment, there's a strong evidence base for how planning can link to that. And all that evidence is used in this template for providing comments back to planners to use in the planning application um, consideration. Um, and it also enables healthcare service provision to be commented upon. So health board colleagues in strategic planning or primary care or estates, they can use the same, same template to comment upon healthcare service issues. And it's potentially section 106 or um, community infrastructure levy contributions can be calculated, but that depends on what's in the local development plan policy. If there's a policy for developer contributions for healthcare service provision, then this template can help Kind of structure how that response might look when they go back. Obviously, there's discussions going on outside of using the template for response between health board and planners, but this helps to kind of bring it all together into a response. Um, so those this template can be used in planning committee reports. Um, the planners can draw out comments from the report from the the template, sorry, and they can use it in developing planning conditions when they're pulling together the report for a planning application. OK, 
Okay, over to you, Gemma. Great, so the last two tools, so I'll talk you through those. So they're linked to um, development plan kind of process. So the first is a development plan tracker. So what we've done is created a, a template that'll you'll be able to download from the website um, that sets out for each of the local health board areas um, what the development plan is in in their area and what stage they're at and and what the key stages are um, to get involved so it's about so it reflects the national level so it sets out future wales the details of future wales the regional level, so when we have strategic development plans, it's got space to include the details of that um, and local development plans. So um, it identifies um, kind of nice and visually where there are overlaps in timing, helps um, health boards with their work programme and resourcing within the team. Um, we think it's also a good way of starting that conversation between um, planners and, and health teams, so making sure it's kept up to date um, and enabling those conversations around what stage you're at, what, what kind of information is being asked for at those stages, so things like submitting sites for future health facilities at the candidate, stage, candidate site stage, um, Health professionals can sit on the steering groups for um, impact assessments. Health, if, um, most local development plans are, have, are doing health impact assessments to support their plan development now in Wales. Um, sharing that evidence and data, shaping master plans, all the things we've um, discussed earlier. So it identifies the key statutory stages of plan development, but I think what we've tried to pull out is it's really, really, really important that they're not the only stages there is that ongoing so start early and keep that collaboration and engagement ongoing throughout the throughout the process what we've we've actually populated them and set um and ascending them to health boards um and planning authorities um as well and what we've done is added in hyperlinks um to the previous stages so some plans um are nearing the end of their review periods others are, are just beginning so where there's, they've already met those um, stages, we've popped in hyperlinks because I think it's a really quick and easy guide. So if you're new in the team, you can click back and see what's already been done and just know where to get that uh, most up to date information. Up to date information on. So that's the development plan tracker. And then we'll move on to the final tool, which so, um, supports the tracker really. It's called the Involvement in Local Development Plan Process. So basically it's a little guide that sets out how health professionals can get involved and shape the development of um, local development plans in their areas. So again, it sets it out by statutory stage, it sets out what that stage is really briefly, what that stage is, and then what opportunities there are for health professionals to get involved. So it also highlights the different roles within health and, and what the opportunities are across health boards, local public health teams at the national scale, environmental health. So bringing clarity to planners as well, what that what those different functions are and, and kind of who they need to be speaking to um, for the different types of information. And it's that ongoing engagement. Can't stress stress that enough. Not just the statutory stage. So it's about building those relationships, knowledge, and skills over the the years it can take to develop a local development plan, and then the benefits that brings to when you're getting to your planning applications. You you know you've got that those skills and understanding and knowledge of the plan and and the planning process. There needs to be that really clear coordinated response from a health perspective. So in those responses back to a local development plan kind of be, it needs to be really clear who's responded from what perspective and um so that just makes it really clear and um, easy to understand from the planners um, receiving that so again it's about working together to maximize those outputs and and we've also highlighted opportunities to work across different sectors here as well so we've again highlighted natural resources wales so it's really important to kind of avoid duplication of work and deliver priorities and maximize those outcomes where we can across a wider range of um issues so i think you know that just embeds the placemaking approach fully there so yeah so i think just to conclude then and then we can move on to 
any questions you might have for us. So we've tried to highlight the importance and the different ways that planning and health um, professionals can collaborate and work together to deliver these healthy, vibrant, sustainable communities. So then these new tools and guides that we've developed and the new structure, the new um, section on the WIASI website, hopefully we're going to provide you a good framework for building um, building on from this, incorporating this into your work and building on the already um, base of work that the team have already um, developed in this area. So it's about implementing these now, shaping them, reflect, um, making sure they reflect your local um, circumstances and help bring those positive benefits and outcomes to delivering placemaking. As, and as we said, that embeds health and wellbeing um, through the planning system. So yeah, hopefully that's been helpful. And I think um, we'll pass back to Jen then to go through any questions and anyone's got. That's great. Thank you, Gemma and um, Cheryl. If you do have any questions, um, do pop them in the chat now. We've got a few minutes, but not very long questions. So, um, so get them in now. Um, one that has popped up in the chat is about um, possibly a little bit before the, the tools you've been talking about in terms of the planning, but how to engage how to engage residents, particularly of rundown areas that might be overlooked, thinking about um, factors that will affect their health and well-being, such as active travel, traffic, um, traffic harming, street trees, litter and noise, and whether any of the tools that you identified perhaps earlier on in your presentations um, could be used to help engage, engage residents in that way. Um, is there anything you want to, to sort of particularly flag up in relation to that sort of very early issues identification stage? Yeah, I think, you know, that's it's important to look as said, with the placemaking approach is about that wider community. It's not just looking at development sites in their narrowest sense. So when local development plans are being um, produced, it's about understanding your local area in its entirety. So like um, Cheryl mentioned, those kind of health profiles and getting that data and understanding of all communities and so not just focusing on what potential new communities there are. Is that really important? Um, bridge between like, and just a place in its widest sense there. So like we said, getting those active travel um, routes to connect to existing communities, not just kind of come out of a new development and just stop. It's, it's that wider sense. So that needs to be looked at um, and that's part of your monitoring of your plans as well. You need to be looking at how that plans that your plans are delivering um, these kind of things. But yeah, I think there's probably the Planning Aid Wales tools. There's probably lots of tools on there around around that. There's a huge list. I didn't want to <laughs> pick it all out, but they they have got um, quite a, a number of um, ideas and suggestions on there. And the education packs again. There's lots of. I suppose it's getting children and young people thinking about how they. There's some tools in there about your walk to school and getting them to think about what's good about that, what's bad about that, and and kind of thinking about that and what would would be beneficial. That kind of information is really key for planners thinking about how spaces already work is at that like, kind of local level. So I think it's a it's a broad range of these tools. Um, yeah, and how they'd reflect on potential regeneration projects and um, for kind of existing communities, maybe. But yeah. yeah, I think um, um, it's in terms of uh, then translating that into information that go to decision makers as a sort of follow up um, point in the chat there. Um, mm. uh, place plans, you know, could be one way, way one way into that, couldn't they? Um, and and the, the tools you mentioned there, particularly Planning Aid Wales, um, Shape My Town can help to, yeah. to influence that. Um, and then, yeah, that information can then be fed up to not just planning, but probably regeneration and, and sort of other sources where there might be more direct funding for those particular matters. I think it's also that um, the cross this is, for me, I kind of see a lot of opportunity here for that joint working collaboration so that data that um, so we're not all going out and trying to collect the same data in slightly different ways and that kind of data health professionals need. 
um, could be really valuable and informative for the planning system. So it's it's kind of identifying those key areas and how we can join up at these key stages. So that's where the tracker, I think, can help. So when people are programming work, there may be opportunities to undertake joint collaboration events or community events. And because um, it doesn't, you don't always have to be, or it has to be regulation 14 or, or um, town and country planning, this, that, and that, you know, is that wider kind of, why do determinants of help can really help shape that without having to say it's a spatial planning thing? That data can be really, really useful. I just add, in, I think also the um, health impact assessment um, process really, that's what it should do is look at the needs of the yeah. whole community if you're doing it thoroughly and you know, exam involving everybody that you should be involving. And that, and I, I know when I respond to planning applications, I do encourage the use of of HIA and um, it's. At the moment, we haven't got it in um, <clears throat> statutory. Um, what's the word? It's not statutory yet because the, there's an act coming in soon that will make it um, mandatory for certain things, such as we think local development plans. But as Gemma said, local development planners, uh, policy planners, are using HIA now in the development of LDPs, as and that's that should look at that broad perspective and the needs of all the population. So you should be looking at the needs of everybody in the deprived areas to different ethnic minority communities, to disabled people, to everybody. It, should, it encompasses a whole range of different people. And that's the idea of it is to get their perspective and in, involve them and engage them and not just, um, you know, not think about that in this, in its broadest sense. So I think HIA is a really important tool to use as, as well. Great, thank you. Um, throughout your presentations, there was very much um, the language of collaboration, engagement, communication. Um, I think a lot of what you've been working on is about enabling people to speak the same language and to talk into the processes that perhaps aren't always aligned as they should be um, and talk into the um, processes across different organisations. Uh, there's a question in the chat about whether there's a uh, a network element to this. Um, is there anywhere where people who work in these different industries can can go to and share ideas and um, perhaps collaborate? Um, um, is that something that's been considered? Um, could be considered? Does it exist already? Um, it will be soon. <laughs> <laughs> that's our intention: is to get a network up and running through through yeah so yeah we really want to, to look at adding a network because we exactly as you said we recognized that partnership collaboration engagement working is so important and uh, definitely something you want to look at doing yeah great yes. yeah excellent um uh, a question here about um uh, are you working with the designers of streets parks public realm to embed opportunities for for healthy lifestyles um so I suppose where does that fit in with things it, it a lot of what you've been talking about is the more strategic sort of policy plan level whereas that level of detail comes a little bit later but perhaps what you're you're feeding into at the policy level will ultimately have an impact further down the line would that be fair to say yeah yeah definitely i think it's the yeah getting the i think we wanted to get that foundation kind of there to build upon so it's is getting those policies in place so when you're determining applications you've got the a really strong policy framework to make those decisions and make sure developments are delivering um all of these things that you need so yeah it's probably a bit too detailed for where we're at i think we've you know um a short term so, so come at looking again these strategic um bits in and getting people talking to each other and establishing that but yeah not to say that's not important and and that's something that could be built on um and obviously the work you do jen in the <laughs> design commission with placemaking you know, it feeds into the placemaking work and i mentioned the placemaking charter and there's a lot of uh, work in there around that probably more that detail in the design of spaces and obviously national planning policy in wales has that um built through it too so i think it was our focus on this was more around that practical bringing people together to get the most out of the policy framework we have um, have there. I think from my experience in um, in Cardiff, if you're absolutely right, it all, it all comes from the policy as a starting point. So if I was to, if I was responding to a planning application, I would draw on the policies of either Cardiff or Vale, depending on what the application, what I was looking at. But then what that enables me to do is to get 
respond in the to the planning application with more detail about the precision of not precision of design, but the concept of the design and how, for example, active travel and cycle routes. You know, it's it's not just about providing a cycle route; it's how you do it, where it is, the how it's where it's sited and how accessible it is. So it enables you to get down to find a detail, I guess, in the comments, but it, it's got to be in the policy to start with <laughs> to, to then comment on it in a, but you can, you can provide more information to the planners. And I've, in my own experience, I found they really appreciate that because it helps them to refine what they're looking at in terms of the planning application as a whole and how they feel it will benefit people who are going to be living on or um, working in that area. It really helps them to help refine the design, but we, we haven't worked directly with, with designers if that was, specific question but you can certainly do it um if the more you in, the more partnership working you do the better it is and the more people you can talk to and the more people that then start to understand you know how you can do it and it's not about big changes a lot of the time it's about small things that maybe haven't just been thought about but actually will have a big benefit for health and well if you do it slightly differently yeah great thank you um and yeah just to to follow up on the mention of the placemaking um wales charter and guidance that's um, something we've developed um, with the Welsh Government, um, Public Health Wales and a range of other organisations and is um, available. Uh, if you go to the DCFW website, there's a placemaking section there where you can have a have a look at that. Um, so that has links to a uh, placemaking guide where you might be able to get some more information about um, those matters. And there's a section in there about the links between placemaking and impacts on health and well-being and the environment and um, and the world um because there's another question about where um access to nature has been factored into evidence or place plans um so so that might be one place to go i think some of the other documents in terms of um information and data you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation might be a place to go for that as well um um, yeah, natural environment stuff. Um, NRW have loads of stuff on that. So you got the state of the state of nat natural resources report. So now, sorry, we just speak in acronyms. I realise. Um, <laughs> sorry. So um, yeah, there's lots of information in that. So now, report is is really good, and the area statement work. So yeah, natural environment. Um, there's lots of information on that. But again, it's that same principle, and they all impact on each other. So it's bringing people together and having those discussions together to maximise for people and the natural environment. And, you know, so you're not, you're you're all coming together with a joined up kind of consensus, I suppose, and that kind of um, not duplicating work and, and how you can shape things to maximise outcomes for all um, aspects. So, but yeah, the natural environment is just absolutely key for, for health in many ways, physical and mental. So yeah, that's, us. We've actually tried to strengthen the tools a bit after the event to incorporate kind of uh, strengthen a bit more of the references to the natural environment. But yeah, it's always been there. We recognize we've always recognized it as being imp uh, important. So yeah, yeah. Great. Um, and the, the the tools that you've developed and mentioned will be available on the Yazoo website. Um, am I right in thinking they're not quite there yet, but they will be soon? Yes, yeah. So yeah, after the, the February event, we did break up groups with them, um, stakeholders on them. So we're reflecting on that and we're we're literally getting the final final changes to those done now. So um yeah, what we'll do is we'll try and um we'll circulate um links to that once they're up and out on the website. But we're also amending the website, so <laughs> it's just a couple of weeks. Um we should be able to send you everyone the links to that. Great. What we didn't say actually, I don't think in the when we we're talking about it was that these tools are not meant to be us saying here you are, this is exactly how you do it. And this is just things that are they are templates, they are guidance, and it's they can be adapted and used as as needed really for local areas. It's it's uh, some of them will be in word format, so they can be changed and put um, local health board logos on, etc. So they can be adapted for for use. So it's not about us just saying here's a finalised version and they can be used as, as needed really. Great, uh, thank you very much. And I suppose um, what would be helpful from um, the audience today is, is sort of using those tools and spreading the word about those tools to, uh, um, to, to get them out there and, and creating those connections that you talk about and um, enabling that collaboration. Um, so thank you very much for questions.
Um, I think if anything else pops up now in the chat, we'll, we'll respond um, via the chat or follow up with an email. Um, thank you for engaging in the, in the discussion there. And um, uh, thank you to Gemma and Cheryl for their, their um, presentations and contribution. A summary of the event, including this the video of this session, will be circulated um, and available on the website after. Um, there is also a link and an email will be circulated about an evaluation of the event. It'd be really helpful, I think, for the team to, uh, if you could fill that in um, and give your feedback. Um, also, if you have any thoughts on future webinar topics, uh, let the team know, um, either through the chat, follow up email, Public Health Wales Network Cymru. Um, and yeah, if there's any other questions, then please do get in touch. But um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Gemma and Cheryl, for, for running through your, um, your work to date, all of which sounds um, very helpful. I think it's really helpful to move things on from um, knowing the theory and getting into the, the doing, and um, those tools will be really helpful for um, uh, enabling people to make those connections and, and, and do that collaboration. Um, so um, I'd like to thank you for coming and we'll, we'll finish there. Thank you very much, Jochen Bauer.